Hey everybody, Elizabeth Nader back with you. Jersey First TV and the Nader Narrative. We are addressing a very important topic right now that's in the news and everybody is talking about. And I want to welcome John Coyle back to the show. Always our legal expert. We appreciate you, John. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Elizabeth. Always a pleasure. So everyone's talking about it. We had a, a decision, if you will, that was leaked from the Supreme Court, meaning it hasn't been formally published yet, but made it into Politico, uh, into the news, which indicates that how the court is going to decide on a current case that it has listened to, and it has to do with the federal abortion law. So what we want to do is really educate people. John, you're very good at doing that. And everyone has uh, opinions about this, as which is understandable. And there's a lot of emotion surrounding this. And this leak created quite an extreme response from both sides. So what I want to do with this interview is educate. We want to build just a little bit of history in. But since you listened to all the arguments in this case, and you've read the leaked opinion, you're going to give us some insight into that which may be different than what people are expecting. So let's start a little bit with the past, because what we're really talking about here is a uh, decision that the Supreme Court uh, passed in 1973 originally, which is the Roe v. Wade. And then again, there was another decision, which I believe the date was 1992, which further sort of defined, changed a little bit, also upheld, and that was the Planned Parenthood versus Casey. So when people hear Roe v. Wade, they hear Roe, Casey, they hear all those terms. Those are the two years we're talking about. And that is um, what is being addressed here in terms right. of what the Supreme Court decided back then. So quickly on the Roe v. Wade in 1973, the Supreme Court ruled the Constitution does protect a pregnant woman, her liberty to choose an abortion. But that really federalized this and gave uh, women federal protection. Right, John? That's right. And, and it's important to understand, and I'll try to be very briefly, what the Supreme Court's role is, right? The Supreme Court's role is to determine if something complies with the federal constitution. If there is a state law, a state action, a federal law, a federal action, whether that complies with the constitution. The Supreme Court is not there to make new law, is not there to give its own opinions about things, is not there to weigh in on entirely state issues. If there's a question on the New Jersey law and whether that complies with the New Jersey Constitution, that never gets to the U.S. Supreme Court. The mm -hmm. question is, does something comply with the, the Supreme Court prior precedent on the Constitution and the amendments there? It's important to remember that the decision on Roe is a kind of squirrely one that's an outlier, even in law school. I don't want, we're not going to talk about the debates about abortion because this isn't about abortion. Right. Even in law school, in a liberal setting, the question comes up, what is the basis for Roe v. Wade? And everyone goes, eh, right? The Supreme Court literally called this the penumbra. They said, if you look at the rights from the 4th and the 5th and the 6th and the 14th brings it all together, that's sort of a penumbra of rights. And somewhere in there is probably this right to an abortion, calling it a right to privacy. Roe v. Wade talked about this in terms of right to privacy and they framed it in those terms. There isn't a right to privacy in the Constitution. There isn't a right to body autonomy. There isn't a right to medical freedom. There isn't a right to an abortion. But the court sort of said, if you pull back far enough and squint your eyes, it's probably there somewhere. Hmm. Uh, and that was a radical departure um, because one of the important things to remember is at that time, abortion in any context was banned in over 30 states. It was definitely banned in the first trimester and even more, uh, after the first trimester and even more. This was a radical uh, turning point for the court. And, and the history of judicial activism, where we have the court sometimes decide to make their own rules called judicial activism. This is probably the height of judicial activism. Not commenting on the subject matter for this, but this is the Supreme Court saying, we're picking a number and we're picking a trimester. And the Supreme Court is saying that this point is when the state's interest flips, that the state has an interest here in protecting it, but before this moment in time, it's the woman's right. And they kind of made it up. And even the people who are staunch supporters would have to agree, the Supreme Court really made it up. 
Well, there's been a lot of commentary since that decision. And as you say, it's probably one of the most discussed cases in law school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many people have commented on it since then. Um, but what it really did was, you know, as you say, there were only a couple states that where you could get an abortion and, you know, in certain certain times in the trimester. Um, and this made it now federally protected. So as an immediate result of that, now all of the states had to allow for some measure of abortions to be legal, correct? That's right. In accordance with the Supreme Court's deadline about the first two trimesters, the, the, every state in the nation had to, had to have its laws combined. And there was a rash of changes, lawsuits, were uh, statutes were challenged across the country and everything rolled back. Supreme Court spoke, that's the instructions. Right. And so that's where when you look at look at it from an activism standpoint, and again, we're looking at the legal aspect, but right. that's where the movement that is uh, calls itself pro-choice would say that's when women now had access to these services in all the states. And that's, of course, when the other side felt as though we had, you know, stepped into um, an area that was immoral, really, is is how they frame the argument and outside also the the um, it should be outside the judiciary to decide upon. So now we have the states uh, all required to offer the service to some degree. 1992 is another case with Casey. How did that further define or change that? It muddied the waters even further. Uh, we're talking about typically things being five, four, six, three close decisions. The Planned Parenthood versus Casey was a two judge majority, four judge dissenting, and then three judges saying, I kind of agree in part of the majority opinion and not and everything else. You read it, it takes a couple of hours to even understand what's part of the opinion and what isn't. And it decided to say that the the whole trimesters thing didn't make sense anymore. And now they're just picking weeks and they're talking about things in terms of viability and stuff like this. It was the Supreme Court again creating a new standard for where it was going to be. And at that time, there were four votes at that moment to overturn Roe and said, this isn't working. This isn't what we're supposed to do. And it narrowly squeaked by. And okay. it's been the number one hot button issue for the Supreme Court ever since. And every judge's yeah. confirmation hearing for the last, since 1973, talks about, are you going to reverse Roe v. Wade? Correct. They asked them, right. Every time that is a big part of the confirmation. So now we find ourselves, uh, fast forward to where we are now. And the case that has just been in front of the court and you listen to all the pleadings in this case is Dobbs versus Jackson, Jackson Women's Health Organization. This is the case that made it to the Supreme Court, which brought this issue back in front of them. Why? What is the case? Well, this is a Mississippi uh, law that said there's a 15 week limit that after 15 weeks, you can't get an abortion except for very limited reasons. And the court, uh, the, the legislature in Mississippi came up with findings about what happens in terms of the fetus's development at 15 weeks versus not 15 weeks. Um, if I start extrapolating on it, it'll seem like this is a partisan discussion. There are certain facts about what um, what sensations a fetus has or everything else like that. At 15 weeks, it's not viable uh, if it did not exist on their own outside of the body. But uh, the, the state legislature in Mississippi came out and said, because of these things, um, this is where we're drawing the line. Um, and it went up to the Supreme Court, and this was one of the most hotly anticipated cases. Now, um, every couple of years, people, this has been a big issue. There's certainly been people who are opponents of abortion or opponents of the unfettered abortions from Roe who occasionally try to push the envelope with laws and the Supreme Court typically slaps them down. The yeah. fact that this one came up in such a glaring um violation of the standards both from Casey and from Roe uh, made this an interesting test case. And when the Supreme Court took certification, granted certification, and brought it up, it got on a lot of people's radar. Uh, so this was really the case that allowed the Supreme Court to weigh in effectively all the way back to 1973 and take another look at that decision. This right. is the case that pushed uh, both Roe and Casey back in front of them. And ultimately, the uh, arguments were framed how? Give us a summary framing of each side of this case. It's a real simple one. Uh, the arguments raised um, uh, against the Mississippi law were a simple one. Uh, Roe and Casey are the law of the land. They've been the law for 50 years. Stare decisis, precedent, 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 follow the precedent. 
It's been governing our country for 50 years. People have lived their lives by it. You can't reverse it. Okay, like that's that's the argument. Yeah. Um, they also argue on the merits that you shouldn't set it at 15 weeks. But their argument was if you listen to it, all you heard was precedent, precedent, precedent. Um, and follow the decisions for the court. And the opposite side uh, in favor of the Mississippi law said, Roe was wrong. Wow. Okay? And just because something's been the law of the land for 50 years doesn't mean you need to follow it. Um, and if you look back, if we all recognize it, and, and Casey kind of recognized that there was no right to abortion in the Roe case, that they sort of found it, but they, even in, in Casey, like it's been around for 20 years, we're going to keep this going in a very narrow way. From a federal jurisprudence standpoint, the Supreme Court is there to take cases where there's a federal question, right? And, and I will tell you um, this, I picked it up far from this, this is too quick to, I don't have it all memorized at this point. Mm -hmm. The idea is, and this came from the oral arguments in this, and this was from Justice Kavanaugh, right? And what he said was, you're talking about the most contentious social debate in American life. That's exactly what it's been for the last, yes. if at least 50 years. And if the Constitution is neutral on the question of abortion, the text and history that the Constitution is neither pro-life nor pro-choice on the question of abortion, then it should be left to the people, to the states, or to Congress, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's that's our country's jurisprudence, right? Right. This nine people in the Supreme Court um, are not supposed to be the people who determine when medical viability is on an issue that's not part of the Constitution. So again, I, I think this is such a key point. No matter how you feel about this decision, which we believe is coming down as as leaked, and we'll talk about what what is said in that decision, but. Yeah. It, no matter how you feel about it from the standpoint of your opinion, when you look at the law and you look at the way the founders created our government and the idea that most things are as, as many things as possible be left to the state in plain language and those things that need to be held and managed and done so at the federal level, yes, that would be you know, what the federal government would do. And then you have Congress, of course, with the ability to create law. So as as the Supreme Court is looking at this from a matter of law and a matter of holding the Constitution, is there even an argument to be had about viability at that point? Is there even an argument to be had about science? Where does that fit into this? Well, and I will tell you that the justices struggle with this during oral argument in the Dobbs case. They're just like, do we need to have every year we rehear this case to determine whatever medical science says viability is here, viability is here? Viability in 1973 is not viability in 2022. Right. Um, and, and why does the rights of the parties, the fundamental rights of the mother and the fundamental rights of the state and the fundamental right of the unborn fetus, why do these change at week 15, 16, 17, 22, 24, 27? Mm -hmm. Like, who are we to say that that's what it is? Mm -hmm. and, and, and there are a lot of issues legal issues where the, the states have different laws on this, right? Um, take our recent stuff. There are different laws about max mandates. There's different laws yeah. about vaccines. Right. There's different laws about what's closed, what's not closed, and everything else like this. We live in a country where everything not prescribed to Congress is delegated to the states. And Congress is a very circumspect area. And if it's not here, it's a state issue. Yeah. And, and, and almost entirely medical issues and things of this nature are reserved for the states. So there's some brilliance in that, in how the founders put that together, because effectively what that does, John, is it gives it back to the people in a direct way. You have an option, A, to live in a state that has that law, right, first of all, but also, you know, more importantly, to vote for the legislators, which, you know, hopefully will pass a law that, that you approve of. And that doesn't always happen, but you have 50 different unique states with unique ways of handling things. And the brilliance behind that is effectively now this is in the decision, in, in the lapse, and the decision is back to the people. That's right. Now, I, I expect Congress to try to weigh in on this, or at least debate it. Um, I don't 
I haven't figured out whether or not this is something that Congress could even weigh in on. Mm. Right? Congress tries and sometimes wait tries in areas that are very well intentioned, but wrong. Um, back in the 90s, there was the Violence Against Women Act, very important uh, thing that's hard to find people who didn't get behind, legislating crimes of domestic violence on a federal level. The problem is that's not something that's for the federal courts to decide. Um, it just isn't. And at the time, Congress said victims of domestic violence are less likely to go cross state lines for work, so it affects interstate commerce. You kind of had to hold your nose when you said it. I yeah. get it. It's a good law. We like the idea of it. That bounced in the Supreme Court. That's not a Commerce Clause question. Yeah. When Congress is given the ability to regulate interstate commerce. It doesn't. It's pretty broad, and Congress has pushed the envelope over the years. But that was too far. That was a law that a lot of people supported. But it wasn't within Congress's authority. Right, which is I, really important. It, it, that's in, critically important that we don't lose track of that, uh, no right. matter how you feel about it, um, about that particular law or any other. So the, the right now what's being said by the left, frankly, is we will take care of this in Congress, almost in a threatening way they're saying that. But if that if they do attempt to do so, John, and, and, and they won't be able to get it through the Senate, we know um, we wouldn't think so based on the numbers now. But even if they did, would that be another fight then in the Supreme Court? It absolutely would. It would be the question of whether Congress is the authority to. Okay. I, I skipped ahead of something, and I apologize for your viewers here. We talked about the one side who was saying um, why you should follow this and, and uh, the idea of the neutrality position. I'm going to tell you the response to everybody you see on TV on certain networks saying, this is a this is precedent. We need to follow precedent. This reverse 50 years of our country's history. You need to follow this stare decisis, all these legal words. You need to follow precedent, precedent, precedent. I'm going to tell you what the court said Okay. at the oral argument. They said just about every case that you've ever heard of. And as it came up in the argument, it said the most consequential, important cases in the court's history the court overruled precedent. Mm. This would be a much different place if we did not do this. And I will tell you what the uh, leaked opinion, to the extent it's going to be final. Uh, well, let's talk, yeah, let's talk about what happened there before you get into the leaked opinion, because yep. I, first of all, a very good point. And I think sometimes we we think that a decision is a decision and that precedence is really rules overall, but it, you know, there is an opportunity to correct something that was perhaps wrong. And uh, okay. this is what may be happening here, but let's talk about what happened with Politico because you have to be fascinated as a lawyer that a decision is leaked. Now we let's opine on that because we don't know who leaked it. We don't know how that happened. We don't know why. Um, give us your personal view. Well, I, I, we may not know who, but I think we know why. Um, this has never happened before. I don't think people appreciate just how unprecedented this is. Yeah. There's been some insanely contentious issues, gay marriage, Obamacare. Uh, there's been a lot of things that come before the court, and, and until the decision comes out, no one knows exactly where this is going to go. And, and um, the standard procedure for the Supreme Court is they have a conference, and they have a caucus, and they sort of do a head tally, and they vote and they make their opinions, and then somebody's assigned the opinion to write it. They write the opinion, and then it's circulated, and then based on what's actually in the text of the opinion, people say, I can join that, I'd like it changed, I don't want it changed, and then that's when people write concurrences, where they say, I agree with the outcome, but here's why that's wrong, or they dissent, I disagree with both of these pieces of that. Those come after the opinion is circulated, okay? And this is a draft opinion dated in February. So this has been around for a long time. We have no idea what the opinion actually looks like at this point. Right. I'd imagine it changed significantly. I would imagine by this point, we were expecting this decision in early June. This might have been ready to drop any minute now. Um, there are. This is a almost a 100-page opinion with 30 pages of appendix, over 60 pages of, of actual opinion. There's probably going to be another 50 pages of dissent, if not more, uh, and more concurrences. This is going to be a 200-page decision by the time it's all done. Right. We have no idea if any of the specific language and some of the arguments from the decision are going to carry on. Um, 
but the core of it is, and this comes back to the point from oral argument, I think it was obvious, and people I know on both sides of this issue, when you watch this argument, you came away saying, oh, this is done. And it's done because it's the right decision. Okay? So, so while you are surprised that it was leaked, while you're shocked at that, and we should all be, yeah. you're not surprised at what it seems to point to in terms of a decision. That's right. And, and I'll tell you the lead argument for this. And this was came up in oral argument. It's also a big, big argument in this brief here. Brown versus Board of Education case everybody probably knows. There's a handful of Supreme Court cases that many people know right. outside of the legal field. Right. Separate but equal is not equal. Justice Thorogood Marshall, before he was Justice Thorogood Marshall, argued this case as the lawyer on appeal, right? right? Separate but equal is not equal. Reverse Jim Crow segregation, yeah. let our civil rights movement from the 60s. Everything where we are today in terms of equal rights and civil rights follows from that case on racial. And that case undisputedly reversed a prior Supreme Court case, okay? Plessy v. Ferguson and a series of cases that when dealing with everything from property of former slaves to escaped slaves to the idea of Pullman cars treating people differently based on race. Plessy v. Ferguson, the Supreme Court said, it's fine to have one set of rules for black people and one set of rules for white people. Okay, that's the deal. That's the law of this country for over, I got the numbers here, 58 years. Wow. Okay? That's the law. Brown versus Board of Education said no. Yeah. And, and, and the question is, how did the court, if, if we're supposed to rigidly follow precedent based simply on the fact that a decision is out there, then we'd be a different country without Brown. If the Brown court said, I can't take this, Plessy v. Ferguson, we've decided this for almost 60 years, that would have never come. You have everything from Obergfell, the decision from um, the decision on same-sex marriage, that overturned the Supreme Court for a case from 1972, said the court can outlaw same-sex marriage. Lawrence v. Texas in 2003 overturned a decision about um, consensual between adults, homosexual relations in a household. In 1986, the Supreme Court said that's illegal or that can be regulated. A state law that, that regulates that is okay. Hmm. Uh, from 86 to 2003, that was the law of the land. The Supreme Court in Lawrence versus Texas threw that out the window, right? You have things that you wouldn't even think about today. Brandenburg versus Ohio. The idea that you, if you advocate free speech for violence, it has to actually be a threat of violence, right? right. That overturned law from 40 years ago in the when we we're in the Red Scare in the 1920s, where just merely saying, I'm a communist, they can put you in jail. That was the law of this country for 40 years. So Advocating communists, they can throw you in jail. You, you give, I mean, I'm sure you have more, but you give a lot of, of examples that basically support the idea that overturning precedents is not unprecedented. Let's say it that way. It happens. It's happened. We have many examples, some that are critical to the survival of our society and us continuing to, you know, be more aware of how we need to act as humans to each other. Some of those are such critical cases that right. changed really unfair situations and immoral situations. Right. So it's not, it's not unprecedented that we overturn precedent. So you're not surprised we don't know if this is the final decision. You seem to think that it will be in some form. Are you are you at that point with this? Oh, the outcome is decided. I think the outcome okay. was decided long before this. And I don't mean this in a negative way. But I will tell you, you just needed to count the votes at the argument of people who said, we all agree that Roe isn't in the Constitution. Yeah. There actually isn't a constitutional right of this. And if there isn't a constitutional right, we shouldn't be picking a standard. It's not for the Supreme Court. Right. To pick the number. Right. right? It's, so this is not the Supreme Court telling women they have no rights. This is not the Supreme right. Court weighing in on the viability of a fetus. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not the Supreme Court. As far as we know, from what we're reading and what you expected, this is about whether or not the Supreme Court should be uh, making decisions that really belong at the state level. So, John, if this is the standing decision, which we expect it to be, um, right. what happens now once that's issued? How does this change now in the 50 states? 
Well, then you have 50 states, the District of Columbia, and Congress race to come up with a standard. Um, and in many sense, that's what history has always had. Um, this is just another one of those topics where the question is, uh, without a congressional, without a constitutional foundation for it, the states are left to do more or less what they want to do. We have yet to see whether an actual state-specific thing can be challenged. This doesn't mean that there's going to be able to be absolute bans on abortion. Right. It doesn't mean anything else like this. And I think Justice Roberts came out, Chief Justice Roberts came out. This is only the issue about this, this holding in this case. It is entirely possible that there will be a state's law that is offensive in terms of how it applies or bans abortion and things like that. And somebody raises a challenge to that. Right. right, based on a constitutional ground that is not before the court now. This this now means the Supreme Court is going to be dealing with this for a number of years yeah. again, Expected. and and, and right. it may and it may come out with a new line. There may be a new case next year, three years from now, five years from now, where they figure out what the line is, where they're willing to say that there okay. is a state's interest on this. It it just is. As somebody who believes in the separation of powers and somebody who believes in the Bill of Rights yeah. and the Constitution, if you take away the idea that this is about abortion, I think everybody would agree with this decision. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. And, and so now it's back to the states. And we know here in New Jersey, uh, we just happen to have had our governor sign into law a Reproductive Freedom Act, which is a pretty yeah. aggressive um, aggressive abortion bill allowing for abortions um, right up to the point of birth, paying for them for people who are not even living in the state and on and on. So that aggressive bill was already signed into law here in New Jersey. So not expecting any changes here in New Jersey, sort of expecting that we're going to see uh, changes along the lines of blue state, red state, um, you know, not surprising. But again, going back to the people and going back to the will of the people in theory, but you're predicting years and years of political, not just political battles, but legal battles surrounding state decisions, and many of those making its way back up to the Supreme Court. That's right. And let's be clear. There's a reason why New Jersey, and I believe Oregon, and there's another state also passed those at the same time as New Jersey. It's because their attorney general, so their governors, watched this oral argument yeah. and said, this it's is coming. bouncing. Right. Like this, this, is, this is happening. And right. if... Yeah. This is a democracy. If the people of New Jersey wish to elect leaders and put legislators in who support this, then that is a reflection of the community standards in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, and and that's how we work in a democracy. And well, and that that is probably the most important point. Once someone's listened to this and been educated, and I hope that people now see this um, in the correct light. Now it's time to to get active. What do you believe? What do you want? your state yep. to stand for. And yes, New Jersey, right. we just passed this, but um, things change when you elect new people, right? So that's why we they do, do that. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and I don't know how many more times we need to be told that uh, elections matter and the right. people you elect from top to bottom of the ballot yeah. matter, yeah. Uh, other than uh, legislators in New Jersey uh, voted for this kind of, it was a mid eight end December uh, yeah. Hush yeah. up! Nobody put the names on the bill. Pass it through. That's right. Um, but um, but it's there, yeah. and it was but signed by our governor. We vote for our governor. So once again, everybody, um, however you're feeling about this, get active. Let your voice be heard because politics are local. It does matter, and the Supreme Court now has pushed this back to the state. So uh, it's time to get busy, and that's where your energies need to be. And we'll be watching it now. It'll be interesting to see when it finally comes out and, and, and you'll read all of it for us, I'm sure. And to see who said what, um, interesting to see what Congress will attempt to do because I'm certain they will attempt to do something and how all of this affects the midterms. Now we're getting into politics. Who knows, who knows how it affects the midterms, but it's certainly a massive issue in this country. Well, I think it brought up, it's going to bring up immediately in racing. People talk about this, an issue that, really dogged in the presidential campaign last time, yeah. the idea of packing the court. If yeah. you don't like the Supreme Court's decision, put some more justices on. Hmm. Um, and then we'll go from nine to, I suppose, 12 or 13 
so that there's a liberal majority. And then the next time a Republican president comes in, we go to 17, and then we go to 24, and then we go to pretty soon the Supreme Court is the Italian House of Commons with 750,000 people. And where does it end, John? Uh, this is why this is why the founders did what they did. We need to get back to uh, the pretty brilliant basics of mm -hmm. uh, the way we were formed and why. And I think everyone getting a good education on that hopefully will stop some of this craziness. But listen, I want to thank you always weighing in for us, educating us so valuable. And uh, there's a lot of emotion out there. And rightfully so. This is a difficult issue. But to understand it legally, uh, to understand why this is happening the way it is, I think is so important. And, you know, I hope they investigate the leak. Uh, we need to continue to protect our democracy. That is just totally unacceptable and uh, clearly on purpose. So we'll see what happens with that. If you read anything interesting, come back and talk about it. Um, I will. That and, means, and, that and, means. and when this decision finally drops in the next couple of weeks, it's ironic. This might have pushed the, 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 the timetable for releasing this out. Yeah. Uh, up a little quicker, but this Perhaps. was this was coming, and um, as you said, New Jersey changed the law because this wasn't a surprise. So if somebody had an agenda to release this draft from February, um, and I believe it was done to try to intimidate justices to change their mind. Of course, and uh, again, everyone put on your critical thinking hat, please, I beg of you, and see the bigger picture and understand it in this context. So, um, and John has helped us do that. John, thank you so much. As always, you make us smarter. Um, we, <laughs> we appreciate Anytime. it. <laughs> Anytime, Elizabeth, my pleasure. All right, we do. Thank you so much. And to my audience, share this, share this with people who are talking about this issue. Make sure they understand the legalities in it before they only focus on the emotion. And you know what, no matter what stand up for what you believe in, it's the most important thing we can do to save our state, save this country. John, we'll have you back. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, All everyone. All right, thanks. Talk to you soon.